Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is uh, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock, so we'll make a prompt start. Um, my name is Aaron Willens. I am the Banking Executive for NAB, uh, covering government education and community business in Victoria, South Australia and Western Australia. Uh, before we begin today, I would like to uh, commence by uh, acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, the traditional custodians of the land on which I am joining you from this morning here in Melbourne. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and um, uh, also would like to extend that respect to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us on today's call. So thank you for joining us for the fourth webinar in our NAB KPMG New View series, which will today discuss refocus to thrive from the inside to outside. 2021 has been a, another year of unprecedented events here in Australia and around the world. And I'm sure we're all sick and tired of talking about COVID, but the primacy of it and the existential nature of it has deemed it a critical one for us to be focusing our attentions on. As we emerge from the disruption and uncertainty of COVID, many for-purpose organisations have begun to refine their operating framework. So um, they are up to speed and that cost structures are appropriately um, uh, built to to enable uh, your organisations to function most effectively in a period of uh, continuously evolving um, and albeit somewhat uncertain uh, external environments. Indeed, central to ongoing survival for for purpose organisations is the need to align your purpose with this new um, new normal to ensure that you're fulfilling your mission as best as possible. Today's presentation examines uh, this notion in greater detail and focuses on the issue of purpose specifically. Um, and so when we're talking about that, what we're really saying is what needs to be considered in your organization's purpose to ensure its ongoing success. Uh, we are delighted again to be partnering with our friends uh, from KPMG and Keith Drury and, and Dale Curry. Um, and those of you who have joined for previous uh, New View events will recall both Keith and Dale presenting their thoughts and insights to you all. In addition to Keith and Dale, we also have uh, John McLeod. Some of you would know John. John is a, a leader in philanthropic services and has been a doyen within uh, JB Weir's philanthropic services team since its establishment. And John will be talking today about some of the latest insights from JB Weir's Charitable Giving Index Report, which is, um, I know, a, a resource that's very valuable to our for-purpose clientele. I'm also really delighted that today we're joined by Anne-Marie Colburn. Anne-Marie is the CEO of Marriott Support Services, a terrific uh, organisation that does a lot of social good, uh, also a fantastic GEC client of ours. Um, and Marie is going to be talking about the importance of purpose and how uh, Marriott's purpose has really assisted that organisation in uh, enduring success throughout what has been a really challenging COVID period. Of course, there will be a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's webinar. So please lodge any questions you may have in the Q&A tab, which is uh, on your screen and no doubt you've used many times before having been to umpteen Zoom meetings, no doubt over the past couple of years. We do wanna make this as conversational as possible. So your questions are really critical in allowing us to do that. Um, and of course, we wanna make it as valuable to you all as possible. So um, hearing what's front of mind for you will allow us to tailor our responses um, to meet your needs as best that we can. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Keith uh, to take it from here. Please enjoy the session. Looking forward to hearing your feedback afterwards. There will be a feedback tab at the, at the conclusion of, session, of today's session. So please, please complete that when you have a moment. Um, but Keith, on that note, I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much indeed. And thanks again to the NAB for facilitating the opportunity to have these conversations, which I hope for those of you joining the call have been informative and helpful, uh, particularly as one has to deal with the unprecedented circumstances that Aaron was describing there. Um, um, I would also, um, on behalf of uh, my colleagues KPMG here, and uh, like to offer my acknowledgement 
to the traditional owners. I'm sitting here in Barangaroo, and so I'm sitting myself on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and uh, similarly would like to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging uh, in doing that. Um, the context of our discussion today is clearly to help uh, get some guidance from those people who advise in the sector, those people who are deeply immersed in the sector, and uh, those people who might help support others looking to support the sector. So I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to uh, have a conversation with my colleague, Dale Curry um, and Anne-Marie uh, from uh, the uh, Marriott Support Services uh, and John. So thank you all for joining the conversation. I'm going to, um, we're going to kind of try to see to what extent we can answer three specific questions here. One is um, to what extent what is it you need to think about in order to align your purpose to make it fit for the new normal? Um, and how, what strategies could you align to enable that purpose to be realized? And um, more particularly, of course, as we start to think outward from an inward perspective, in so far as we have spent a lot of time thinking about how do we refine our operational environment to make it more sustainable? How do we now communicate that to a broader cohort of our community, not just the people we serve as part of the services that we deliver, but also those people who are uh, our donors or our more broader support base. And how do we make sure that they understand the strategies that we wish to adopt? So the conversation today will be uh, initially a presentation by Dale to talk through some of the work that he's been doing specifically on behalf of not-for-profit groups in helping them to work through some of the quick answers to those questions I've just posed. And then we're gonna hear from somebody who's actually done this stuff, which is really fantastic to be able to have the opportunity to hear from Anne-Marie about the way she has had to think through the uh, areas of uh, main or building and, and creating resilience through the crisis to the point whereby she creates the flat platform for Marriott to become a very sustainable and growing business. And then I uh, hope we'll be joined, of course, by John to give his insights on the way in which the donor base are currently thinking and what the changes there have been perhaps to the approaches to giving. So um, I'm delighted, as I say, to be joined by Dale. Dale's a partner in our business advisory services practice within K KPMG's enterprise division. And Dale, I guess, um, perhaps to start with, um, some of your reflections on um, the way in which those clients that you've been working with have been, have, have been able to sustain themselves over the recent times and more particularly how they're thinking about the future. Yeah, no, th thanks very much, Keith. And, uh, and morning, everybody. Lovely to be back again at, a, at an NAB KPMG webinar. Um, really good question, Keith. How have the organizations we've been working with been able to sustain themselves? Look, I think, um, if I, if I think back to 2019, late 2019, uh, the world was a, a very, very different place. Organizations were uh, really doing lots of different things. Uh, there, was a, there was a sense of confidence um, in the market. There was a sense of confidence around, around funding. And, and I'm speaking in broad terms, different sectors, you know, different subsectors would have had different headwinds, but generally people weren't dealing with these real existential um, threats and, and significant disruption to the operating environments that, that we've experienced in the last couple of years. So for me, what has is, what is allowed organizations to come through this period? I think a couple of things. One um, is really a bit of navel gazing, right? To, to look internally and say, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And is it furthering our purpose and is it supporting those, particularly in this sector, is it supporting um, the people who depend on us? Uh, the second thing I think organizations have done particularly well is collaborate, right? And reach out, reach out to their customers, reach out to their suppliers, reach out to their support users and, and really link arms and, and work out a way to get through this. You might've remembered in wave one, you know, lots of organizations in, in the not-for-profit sector reached out to local councils, for example, where they, where they had leases so that they could work out different arrangements and, and, and sort of um, they really negotiated hard with those partners, uh, which probably hadn't happened previously. 
And the last thing is organizations have really focused, right? And so they've tended to narrow down their scope of focus and say, we are going to do less, but we're going to do it incredibly well. And so that's probably just a, those are, those are my reflections and, and just a, a short way, if you don't mind, Keith, I'll pop the presentation on the screen and Absolutely. just talk to it for a minute. Thanks so much. So I will get the technology working. Um, and I'm assuming you can see the screen. Not yet. Okay. So really, this, this is a very short presentation and this is a really complex issue. So uh, we'll talk about some some meaty subjects, but talk about them reasonably quickly. The first one is, is, is about purpose and, and really why is it critical? So this point has been made time and time again that the world that we're living in is changing all the time. And, you know, it's becoming more and more uncertain. I'm sure many people on the call would have heard this, this concept of the VUCA environment, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous. And that's really the world that we live in today. Um, we, we're actually living and grappling with the degree of uncertainty in an operating environment context that we probably haven't dealt with before. And so what this is requiring is it's requiring leadership and organizations to engage with that uncertainty. And it's re requiring organizations to become more and more agile, right? And so there's this, there's this balance between being agile to respond, but being focused on what organizations need to do. And arguably that, that last point on, on this particular slide is, is how the not-for-profit sector in particular will feel the impact of this uncertainty um, in a much more pronounced way than some other, so, some other sectors. And why do we say that? Well, for a, for a long period of time, there has been uncertainty in the not-for-profit sector. I'm sure we'll hear from John about about um, sort of donor habits and donor trends, but we know that that funding is is challenging. We know that the sector is becoming more and more competitive, and so there is this uh, there's this innate level of uncertainty that sector participants are dealing with. So layer over this very complex operating environment and, and external environment, uh, these impacts are, are very pronounced. What we saw before the pandemic, so this, this is a sort of an anchoring slide from a pre-pandemic perspective. Um, you know, organizations, as I mentioned, were, were doing a lot. Um, so there was a belief that, you know, there's, there's greater need, organizations need to fulfill that need and, and therefore need to expand their services, need to expand their offerings. Um, we saw organizations really go, well, we, we're servicing one cohort of, of support user or of clients. We can just expand and support a, a similar cohort, even though they're not exactly the same. Uh, we, we saw a number of organizations say, we, we have these big brands in the sector. We've now got permission and we've got a value proposition to just shift our focus from what we're doing to something else or just to extend and stretch that brand permission a little bit. And lastly, we saw organizations respond quite dramatically to changes in the competitive environment. So it's no, it's no secret that um, lots of for-profit organizations have moved into what has traditionally been considered the not-for-profit sector. And so now we're seeing not-for-profit organizations respond. The irony of all of this is that in trying to do more, um, organizations often have a smaller impact, right? And, and those are for the reasons that I put down the right-hand side of the page. So purpose can or has become diluted. Um, organizations can become less effective, right? As they are doing more, they're sort of, there's, they are achieving less across a, a broader range of, of topics. Um, brand positioning and brand identity, which historically never used to be that important um, and has become important, can often get diluted when organizations tend to do or, or attempt to do too much. And as a consequence, um, impact is reduced. And I think this is, the, this is sort of the last thing that any of the leaders of these organizations would have wanted to achieve is 
is, is lessen the impact, but actually we've seen that happen a couple of times. And so, you know, I don't think I need to talk to this audience in particular about why purpose is important, but again, just an anchoring slide because it's, it's been so important in the work that we've done over the last 12 to 18 months is just to realign organizations and teams around purpose, right? So uh, what is the why? Why do the organizations exist? Why are they doing the work that they are doing? The purpose also helps drive clarity across different stakeholder groups and, and can help you know, answer A, fundamental questions, but B, and importantly, uncover new possibilities and C, just bring a sense of focus to activities and investment. And you know, that, that second part there around investment is we've seen very, very um, high degrees of interaction and collaboration between boards and management teams through COVID-19 and, and through the last 18 months. And so where organizations have absolute clarity of purpose, those discussions around investments are that much easier when they get put to the board and, and actually to the banks. So where does purpose sit in an organization? So we, we tend to think of purpose sitting at the very top of the pyramid, right? Um, it defines the why, it, it considers impacts on customers, members, employees, communities, other stakeholder groups. And, you know, it sits above the strategy and the strategy is then um, enacted and implemented to achieve the purpose. We all know that to, to successfully execute a strategy, you need an, an absolutely solid cultural platform. And so, so culture then supports a stra the strategic execution and you see the outcome of all of that in the business performance. And there will be a number of variations of this particular slide and, and a number of different perspectives, but you know, from a KPMG perspective anyway, we see purpose sitting absolutely at the top of the pyramid. And so, again, reflecting on the last 18 months, a lot of the work we've done has been around strategy, but actually just helping organizations to pause and think about the work that they're doing and think about how it aligns back to purpose. And so a lot of the time we've been asked to, to, to really get a sense of alignment around core purpose and whether or not there's been sort of any, any um deviation from that purpose. And so the, the key to this is to engage in the stake, to engage with stakeholders and to engage with as many stakeholders as possible. And, you know, this is a very simplified um, sort of uh, chart of what the process is, but, you know, it's, it's getting your stakeholder group to answer a couple of really fundamental questions. So what was the original purpose of the organization and, and is everybody clear on what the organization was, was um, uh, created to do and to deliver on initially. Um, is that original purpose still valid? And what is the purpose the organization is, is fulfilling today? And we see this from time to time, we see this sort of purpose drift. When an organization was created to do one thing and just over time uh, lands up fulfilling a completely different purpose. That might be relevant, but we have to ask these questions. And finally, the, the, the last question, which is a really simple question, but it sort of goes to the heart of the matter is what should the organization's purpose be tomorrow and into the future? And so this process gathers input from a wide group of stakeholders, as I mentioned. And through this process, we start refining um, that organizational purpose to a point where there is absolute alignment um, uh, across what the organizational purpose is and really what it should be. Probably, Keith, the last thing I would say is um, it, sort of before I hand over to you and, and the rest of the participants is, you know, it's very hard to think about purpose in isolation. Purpose has to be thought about in context of the strategy and absolutely in context of the stakeholder base and the people who engage regularly and not so regularly with the organization. It absolutely has to resonate. And that sort of makes me think of the, the holding slide that of, the, of the oarsmen all rowing in the same direction at exactly the same time. 
Fantastic. So I'm going to stop sharing if that's okay. Well, thanks, Dale. That's been fantastic to be able to uh, position the conversation. So I'm now del I'm very delighted now to be able to uh, introduce um, our listeners to Anne Marie. Uh, Anne Marie obviously uh, is the CEO of Marriott Support Services, and I wonder, Anne Marie, it might be helpful perhaps for you to reflect for the audience some of the experience that you went through and the organisation had to go through. Uh, as part of the impact of COVID? Yes, it was a, a welcoming. I didn't expect to, a new role at this organisation. And, you know, you think four weeks into the job, say, welcome, here comes COVID. Uh, and uh, on top of having to do a major business transformation. But I saw that as an opportunity because people look at the negativity around COVID and, and the, the impacts of major uh, sector changes and if you look at it through the lens of something positive and how can we respond and what do we need to do to meet the market and how can we stay ahead of the game for the future um, and, and you know that's a key component because then if you can start looking at that as an opportunity then you can look at what you, what your business is currently doing and what do you need to do so it's the fundamentals of what we've all got to do with our strategic planning position is that is the basic SWOTs what we need to do and what do we need to change and uh, what's the mindset of my staff and their culture uh, you know and, and most of uh, my colleagues would also experience the same old behaviors that they, they fall back to as you know they've been uh, entrenched and brainwashed over many many years to love the clients to death uh, and deliver to our um, commercial contracts a, a beyond the funding line but as uh, we now have to view ourselves as a social business irrespective of what our mission is so my core business is um, disability services and social enterprises, but we have to be fee for, fee for service. And for us to survive, I have the responsibility of over 200 staff. And as a consequence in that cascade, there's over 200 families I'm responsible for. So I need to make sure that's just with the employees and, and also not the um, core stakeholders that we support in disability. So at the end of the day, I have to make sure that my team and I run a sustainable business so everyone can take home a wage and support their families. So the responsibility of um, for purpose organisations is quite uh, wide when you start looking in the ripple in the pond. And um, I've also reflected in looking at um, some of our um, commercial clients and seeing what their needs are and what the gaps are. And it's been very interesting uh, for, for a number of those and also talking to other stakeholders and one of the comments I said the other day uh, that I received from um, a major organisation was, where have you been? We'd love to see you in, in open arms. Come and see us now quickly so we can start negotiating business. This is around our social enterprises. But in my area, you know, we're supporting people with disabilities. We were originally set up to look after people with intellectual disabilities, but that's evolved and changed. So now we look after and include people with disabilities and we regard all of our employees as equal. So we have employees with disabilities and their main pursuit in life is exactly the same as ours, not to be limited what we can and can't do, but let's have, let's be, you know, get a job that's important. Let's bring in a wage that enables us to live and have social, you know, economic security. They're the same fundamentals that we've all got. So in restructuring and reevaluating the business and making some painful decisions um, is that we've been able to uh, embrace um, new commercial contracts, new opportunities. Uh, COVID has actually identified quite a few other things out there for us to think about. And one of the highlights for me, particularly around a social business, is that we had a reality check trying to source PPE and, and supply chain issues of how much we rely on China, on one individual through all of our business and supply chains. And that cascades right through my business. So um, we started talking to our um particularly for our warehouse clients, is where we can get new supply chains. So, for example, we spoke to a major supplier and suggested that they shift their business from China to Vietnam, and that's freed up supply. So just working with our existing, um, what I call our commercial partners, has opened up other opportunities, and they ring and say, can you do this? And um, there's other elements there. We've, we've pivoted our business with our products and what we do on its head. So what are... What can we do differently? Who else would be interested in this? Uh, an example in our dry food products, so going from pizza flour and dog herbs, we now have a major um, uh, spice chain that we look after and we do three and a half thousand jars a day. And that's a new business line. 
The other opportunity, for example, for us was looking at what product, what business equipment we've got out the back. And so now we do, we can do filling, bottle fillings and other things. We wanted to have a unique um, proposition, which the staff have come up with a range of ideas. And uh, so we keep changing the dimensions. So we're not trying to be a traditional old, what the old language was an ADE. We don't want to do that. Everyone else is in that. Nor do we want to be in coffees or car washes, all those things. We want to look at volume quality business that's, that provides solutions for business. Um, and we've actually managed to thrive during the last uh, year and a half and through a crisis. And we have kept our doors open, though at one stage we were looking through a pretty black hole uh, with a lot of shutdowns of business. And But the opportunity that came out of that, one of our, our other commercial providers uh, rang us desperate because with the shutdowns, they had a snake infestation and our environment management services, we were an essential service, went to the rescue of that neighbourhood estate and that's led to all more business. So being available, being thinking innovatively, agile and responding to what the needs are of the, of, of the external it's, market. It, it's, that's fantastic. And there's so much to unpick from the comments <laughs> you've just made there. I'd like to perhaps bring John in in a minute after I ask you a question around the culture and I think that John hopefully will then come in perhaps to reflect on the engagement of corporates around the mission of the Marriott support services itself, because I can see there was opportunities that many corporates would look to help support as part of their own corporate citizenship, the nature of what Marriott is doing. But in context of culture, when you talked about the way in which you had to think differently about the way you delivered your services, I suspect you'd have had some pushback from those people within the organisation who obviously um, love their clients to death. And as you said, the danger with that is obviously you get a scope creep, for want of a better term. Yeah. How do you deal with that? Uh, a variety of techniques that regulate, they're all tailored differently to the to different individuals. So um, I know we all love in this position when people say to us, but we've always done it this way. And you say, well, we need a business survival. And I always use the example of my responsibility to them and their families to make sure that I continue to pay them and for the organisation to keep its doors open. And when I start thinking through those elements with that, but it's different techniques and also in empowering them to come up with creative ideas to, to do change. And I have gone bypass the executive and senior leadership team and I empowered a person that was about the second bottom in the ranking in one of the areas and gave her the task of leading the, the major reconfiguration of the warehouse, for example, and she had full authority from me to boss around the, the leadership structure above her. And she delivered those goods, put a lot of innovation in them. So it's picking um, your people, the champions on there and having the different techniques, but also trying to be patient as much as you can, because for them, in any business transformation, it depends on that individual's background experience and their willingness to come on the train ride with you. So it's very hard to explain, but I tailor it for everybody that's different, at different responses. Well, I, I just, you know, the, the story there of identifying the skill sets within the organisation and being able to exploit those for the benefit of the, of the broader organisation, because you played to the... Um, you played to the emotive element there to some extent by suggesting that a sustainable business was in the best interest of all people over the longer term and therefore you were looking out for them and their families as much as uh, you were necessarily trying to drive a uh, significant change in the way support was delivered so it, you know it's a great story to to hear so thank you for that Anne Marie and just got John bringing you in here um, having heard what Anne Marie has said and um, you know the first thing that occurred to me is I suspect that there's a number of corporates who would be very interested to hear the story of what Marriott's doing. Um, uh, but I would get your views on how that's evolving within the corporate space from a corporate giving perspective. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Keith. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting on the corporate space and I'll, I'll chat later perhaps about the high net worth space, but both of those areas um, kept and grew their support fairly strongly to the sector through COVID, um, unlike other fundraising that we can chat around. And um, with the corporate sector, I think it's just that continued evolution of their understanding of their role in society. And, and that's changed dramatically over the past 30 or 40 years. And if anything, it's accelerated in the past five years. So we had a situation um, 
in 2020 that corporate profits were down and yet they their giving was up around 20 plus percent 25 percent through support of both bushfires in 2020 and then COVID. We're just in the process of finalising our numbers for 2021 um, that's been released in the AFR on the 3rd of December. And the um, almost final numbers there suggest it'll be up again um, in 2021, which given last year had some big one-off giving, um, I was a bit surprised at that, so and, and very thankful. But Anne-Marie commented a lot about social enterprises. I, I find it quite interesting last year in the top 50 corporates. So we're including, you know, the big banks, the big mining companies, um, um, you know, KPMG, accounting firms, all the rest. Um, <clears throat> the uh, who gives a crap toilet paper maker, a social enterprise got into the top 50 because of the huge demand for toilet paper. This year in the top 50, we're going to see thank you group who, what do they make? Hand sanitizers. And, you know, just given the happenstance, taking advantage of the situation, um, they've done very well. So I think that social enterprise model um, is growing and being recognised more mainstream and corporate support of the for-purpose sector has grown and broadened quite a lot. And I, I think just the final comment there is it's being done in new ways. The traditional companies are still doing it um, how they did shared value is a, is a big issue, but groups like Atlassian and Canva recently talking about what they're doing, this pledge 1%, um, I think we're seeing a great evolution with a lot of that as well. So it's a pretty exciting space, I think, and um, I don't believe a lot of for-purpose organisations take full advantage of that as yet, so I think it's a real opportunity. Yes, I think that I think I would agree with you. And uh, just to talk on behalf of KPMG, KPMG has got four pillars of citizen of uh, what we call our corporate citizenship. One is uh, support for Indigenous peoples uh, and Indigenous businesses. The other three are climate change, uh, mental well-being, and skills for the future. And Marie, so I guess in some way, shape, or form, you know, there's 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 obviously uh, a number of ways in which collaboration could be achieved around those mm -hmm. around those pillars to some extent. But um, Amory, bring you back in there again. And um, to what extent have you had to think about how you now can communicate that strategy more broadly? And um, to what extent are you spending more time outside of Marriott talking about Marriott than you were talking about the evolution of change inside Marriott? It's, thanks, Keith. It's a bit of a mixture because uh, under Zoom, my, my life has been mainly under Zoom or on the phone talking to the uh, uh, um, Key network, key network contacts as well, uh, despite a few short intervals of where we were allowed to be outside and play outside. But the key around that is, is the uh, open engagement and, and conversations with all of that and trying to um, work through opportunities or answer key questions. But there's a whole stakeholder chain that you've got to do. It's not just the, the commercial clients you've got. You've got the government departments and also how to advocate and steer through those ACNC changes where you're not allowed to criticise government and how you work through your professional bodies to lobby through to talking to your staff um, and the families and our people that uh, we with disabilities that uh, within our employment uh, chains or in our support services. So it's a whole mixture, but I can't do it alone. So it's a shared responsibility amongst the teams and we have um, clear understanding who does what and uh, and who to speak to and how to step up where we need to, to bring in a heavy hitter um, or we need to delegate down for someone to do the follow through. So it's a simple business practice that occurs in any commercial environment. But uh, it's not, we prefer to do telephone or Zoom engagement rather than a, a diatribe of emails and paper. Yeah, no, I, the face-to-face, the -face, albeit virtual, is obviously far more powerful. I'm going to ask a quick question and then go to pass to Dale to reflect on the role of boards in this. But clearly you talked about advocacy and influence. How, how's that played out as regards the board of Marriott and, and their engagement with the strategy? Uh, I've actually been very fortunate to have a very engaged and very um, informed board and uh, they take an active keen interest in strategy and being very supportive. So when I went outside for professional to tap on somebody's shoulder professional company to come in and do a, a brutal assessment of my business 
uh, operations and, uh, and I told them about it afterwards. They said, oh, great idea and very supportive and wanted to meet them and, and you know, grill them about those bits and pieces. And um, uh, I thought, oh, I'm going to die here or, or I'm going to get a gold elephant stamp, but it worked quite well. But no, they're very supportive, um, very, very keen to see the organisation grow and uh, have some great ideas themselves in terms of strategy. I can't keep up with them some days when, they, when they're on, a, on the run with their ideas. Well, yeah. And have you noticed a deepening engagement as a consequence of COVID? Um, yes, um, I've had, to, it's interesting that with COVID too, because most of us would have all, you know, we, we had weekly board meetings. I got to know my board very fast and very rapid and uh, over that period of time, but they're also very um, uh, observant as well. And they could see um, how exhausted our, my team have been and myself. And, but when they've been in here, they, you know, they're very, got a good set of eyes. I'd say most of them, if they're not in their formal lives, would have been policemen because they, they spot a lot of things, which is good and, and good and bad. And they walk up to anybody and you know, have a conversation, get good feedback. So Dale, having heard Anne-Marie reflect on the value of that board interaction, um, I suspect that you've probably seen some good things and bad things at a board level, um, but generally it's been quite supportive as, uh, in my experience across the full purpose sector. Yeah, absolutely, Keith. So we've, so uh, Anne-Marie's experience is absolutely consistent with what we've seen. Um, where, where it's been sort of testy, where the relationships have been testy, the exec have tended to, tended to feel that the board has uh, overreached, but on the whole, boards have been very supportive um, and, and, and really um, sort of rallied around the executive teams and in particular the CEOs um, to just give them that extra level of support. And, you know, Anne-Marie, I think you said you were meeting uh, the board weekly we saw that across a number of our clients and and look there's some personal responsibility that the, the, the directors have a have a duty to to lean in at a time of crisis and and um, make sure that they meet their fiduciary responsibilities but uh, you know without doubt there was strong desire to see these organizations succeed to to, to sort of um, weather the storm the storm so to speak Don, perhaps if I could ask you to reflect on the commentary around the health of a for-profit or for-purpose organisation and the relationship that has to relationships with your high net wealth donor base um, and what they're looking for in particular. Could you perhaps offer a few remarks around that, please? Yeah, for sure. And I'll link it in to, to COVID as well. And um, not that I think COVID is going to be an ongoing um, issue. I think it was a fairly one-off, short, sharp fall in philanthropy and predominantly because we couldn't hold events and um, people, organisations couldn't get close to their, um, to their donors. And so uh, while we did see a very, very sharp fall, um, I think all really COVID's done when we look back in a few years' time will be that it's accelerated what was an ongoing change in philanthropy. And um, that ongoing change is mainly the fall in the, the broad mass market in terms of the proportion of donors. But within that, your existing supporters have been more and more generous. And I think that happened during COVID as well. So really hard to acquire new donors. That's always been the case, but I think it's getting even tougher. But existing donors um, have actually increased. So when you add that to the fact that we've seen very strong growth in high net worth giving, um, what that means is you need a closer relationship with donors. Um, high net worth giving generally requires more talk around impact and you know, what difference does this make rather than an emotive ask. And I'm generalising a lot, but people actually want to know what, what difference it's going to make. What are the measurements? What are the numbers? So that discussion, um, being able to articulate the, the, the change in impact that you're having, um, rather than just we're doing good, uh, has become more and more important. And um, you know, we saw in 2020 uh, individual giving go up predominantly um, uh, through COVID. We saw the high net wealth numbers and stock markets around the world at record levels. So COVID um, really affected the population uh, very, very differently. And 
Now that wealth gap has happened in philanthropy as well as the general population. So if anything, a greater focus on high net wealth, we're seeing good growth. I think it's got a long way to go, but the discussions are different. They need that measurement stuff. And same goes for corporates. The discussions again are different. Um, while we're seeing growth, it's around the shared value, the match that the for purpose organization has to the corporate's business, being able to articulate why that's a good match rather than you're a big corporate come and support us because we do good stuff. That's not the argument that washes. It's that shared value type argument. So I think really um, huge changes are being accelerated um, due to COVID and the actual quantum of numbers. Um, generally, we see philanthropy rise five or six percent per annum, um, give or take most years. And it fell during COVID in a, an FY basis by about 5%, a um, little, little over that in 2020, even with the big bushfire giving, and we remember that. And then in 2021, it was down again by another 5%. So think about where it would have been without COVID, and we have seen that big fall off. Um, so I think we're seeing a recovery, but the market for where your growth is in philanthropy is just very, very different and uh, accelerating with that, that need to have a different language. Absolutely. So just, uh, and again, I suspect that some of the strategies that were previously deployed have obviously been effectively sidelined as a consequence of COVID. That is the fundraising balls and the galas and those kind of what were seen as the a staid way, if that's the right term, of raising uh, awareness and funding have been completely and utterly um, disrupted, for want of a better term. Yeah, th th they have. And look, they were always a, a lower return on investment, those sorts of events, um, and I guess more competitive, but they were good for introducing people to organisations. So you've got to really be careful about the rationale for the big event these days. Um, if it's to introduce new people, okay, but if it's your primary fundraising source, it was getting more and more difficult and then during COVID just impossible. So I, I suspect that change is going out and, um, you know, looking for introducing new people, getting your brand awareness out has, um, again, has accelerated and changed as well. Brand awareness is very, very important in the sector, um, but the old ways of doing it, I think, are, are getting more expensive and tougher. And Marie, just to perhaps um, I'm, I'm going to ask each of you to come out with your three key takeaways before we go to a and a but I'm just perhaps intrigued by, uh, if I may ask a question of you in relation to the engagement with government as a funder for Marriott and whether that's now become more competitive or you've actually defined yourself so well that you are the um, supplier of first call for the government. Um, I think the key, we don't, uh, we're moving away from a huge reliance on government funding, hence our focus on growing our social enterprises. So our government revenue at the moment uh, sits, uh, sits about 34%, with most of our other revenue coming through what we, what we generate through our own business activities. And uh, we would always welcome and look for more growth opportunities with government, um, particularly through the social procurement uh, framework and obligations. Fantastic. So can I just ask, what is the percentage of revenue you now derive from your social enterprises and how much that's grown? It's now 64%. Uh, it's complete reversal from where we've been in the last two, two and a half years. Yeah. Well, I think that's a fantastic testimony to your leadership mm -hmm. and the development of that as a new business model. So thank you, Anne-Marie. But um, I think we're now going to ask each panellist to come up with their three key takeaways for the audience. And Dale, I might pass to you first, if you're happy to share those, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Keith. So, so really, when it comes to purpose, uh, less is often more, right? So the, 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 the more prescriptive you can be, um, the better uh, and the greater your chance of creating impact. Um, focus and clarity are essential to direct efforts, right? And uh, this is efforts of the team and, and efforts of where the organization expend uh, resources, both human and financial. And finally, you know, there's a great need for alignment across a number of business dimensions, right? So across the, the board and the executive team, between the teams, um, and really across the organization. So those are my three key takeaways. 
Thanks, Dale. Um, I think uh, Anne Marie there. What are you? What would be your three? My three is, is a, um, saying that COVID and major disruptors should be looking as a major catalyst uh, to change your ways of working and thinking. So not to take the negative viewpoint. So there's great opportunities if you embrace that line of thinking. Uh, the other key one was that uh, organisations need to pivot their business and that's the being agile and to respond and to emerging changes and meet the market because the world keeps changing. If we don't change with it, we get left behind. And one of the ones that we all get faced with is don't get distracted by the noise. You've always got the naysayers. So be clear and focused and cut through. When you do the actions and just do it, as the old Nike brand says, then the, you will get the results. So you sometimes you've got to be really, you know, get the um, push really hard to get through those changes. And have a clear understanding of purpose that people can get behind. Exactly. So stay focused on that all the time. Fantastic. And John? Um, so mine, I'm um, focusing a little bit more around COVID and how it affected philanthropy. Um, it had a dramatic effect. Um, we saw all the events cancelled, as I mentioned before. Donor contact was really difficult. However, we think it bottomed around December 20, and um, we used uh, the Charitable Giving Index data to support that. Um, and, and really, it's not to be distracted by what we think was a short, sharp um, fall. The, the long-term trends in philanthropy that we've been talking about for a fair while are continuing and have accelerated. And really, that's meaning having a, a, an increased um, focus on higher net worth giving on the corporate area that we talked about as well and understanding what drives those two areas. And I'd also add the quest to that as well. Um, the looming intergenerational wealth transfer with most people's asset values with housing and um, you know, share market superannuation are at all time highs and uh, the baby boomer bubble moves on. So those other areas of fundraising are particularly important to be um, bedded down. Thank you, John. Um, those three takeaways from each of you are absolutely fantastic uh, learnings for all to adopt. So um, I welcome back Aaron to help us discuss some of the questions that you've been kind enough to put into the chat room and more particularly prior to the presentation. So over to you, Aaron. Thanks, Keith. Yeah, really good conversation, um, everyone. Thank you for that. I really love the, the three takeouts, really distilling what was a really uh, rich conversation into some immediate takeaways for everyone on the call to, to think about and, um, um, and consider the application to, to each of their organisations. So um, a lot of questions came in prior to the webinar and uh, a couple have come in since. As Keith just mentioned, if you've got any questions that, that have sprung to mind, please do jump into the Q&A and put them in there. Um, I just want to pick up, John, on perhaps initially um, you were talking about corporate giving and how that's been you know quite strong and certainly we see some you know tech unicorns you mentioned canva being one but also atlassian being a very successful tech australian tech company and, and their pledge one percent pledge and i think one of the things for a lot of for purpose organizations is they see this very broad um, expanse of corporate organizations and i think you you highlighted how they might go about building that alignment around which ones to target um, around shared values uh, and so on. But can you just provide a little bit more detail as to how a, a for-purpose for, for organisation may consider how they can best approach corporate organisations to get the best bang for their buck, so to speak, because it is a resource-intensive exercise, building that relationship, building the connection uh, for what is hopefully going to be a long-term relationship between both that organisation and what is ultimately a donor. To you, John. Are you with us? I'm not sure John might have frozen there. Dale, I don't know if you have any initial views on that. A check. It's uh, pro bono. It's goods and sorry. Most was I cutting out then? Yeah, no, um, we, we haven't. Most got, John, sorry, we haven't had anything from you so far. So I think if you start from your the commencement of your your comments, that would be terrific. Thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so I was going to say with corporate giving. First thing, it's important to understand that most of it isn't just a big check. 
um, a lot of it, and in some cases most, is pro bono services, it's goods, um, goods and, and services as well, pro bono support, um, it's knowledge, it's those sorts of things that, uh, that you're getting, as well as money. So it's thinking about what your expenditure is as a not-for-profit and what type of organisations may be best placed to provide the things that you would spend cash on. So what do you need as a not-for-profit? The second thing I'd say is the, the business case that you should be thinking of putting together for them should actually be written as though you were in the corporate. So if I was the corporate getting the note or report from you requesting support, and I have to take that to someone to approve it, you should be writing that business case for the organisation um, and saying how that organisation aligns with you, you know, is it that their customer base is well aligned with your charity or care about it? Uh, does it help them get a better selection of employees? Um, does it make them look better in the eyes of government for procurement? Things like that that Anne-Marie mentioned. So um, I think there are a few different uh, areas there. And it's also not to ignore the smaller not-for-profits. Um, some of those do remarkably um, large and generous um, stuff in the sector as well. So uh, it's having that broader view. And I think us putting a list out of the top 50 as we are and people studying that and getting an understanding of the, the links is really important. Yeah, terrific. Thanks, John. Um, I might move on to the next question. And Dale, I think Dale and Anne-Marie might be sort of best place to comment on this. But... Um, the question is, is the new normal creating increased opportunities to merge similar organisations within the not-for-profit arena? Um, and particularly, there's a lot of, um, uh, uh, you know, I guess there's a lot, a lot of sort of state boundaries which will essentially sort of define um, or demarcate organisations that for all intents and purposes are undertaking the same mission. Um, but also we see a lot of not-for-profits operating in the same space or similar spaces. So I'd be interested in what your views were, Dale, perhaps first, and then Anne-Marie. Sure. Yeah, no problem. So, look, I think the, the short answer to that, Aaron, is yes. Um, the new normal is, is potentially creating uh, more of those kind of opportunities. The reason, let's just unpack the reasons for that for a second. Um, typically what we've seen in the sectors, we've seen, the new normal um, sort of imposed some very difficult um, operating circumstances on organizations. Some organizations have risen particularly well and dealt with the new normal particularly well and enhanced their position of strength and others haven't managed to do that. And so where you've had this, where you've, ha where you've had this sort of um, dichotomy of, of responses and performance under the, these very, uh, trying trading conditions, I think that's that's resulted in greater opportunity for amalgamation inside of the sector. And, you know, a, you can take aged care, disability services, and a lot of social services. There's a long tail of a few big organizations and then a long tail of smaller organizations. And typically those smaller organizations have, have struggled, um, but yet the, the, the services that they deliver and the impact that they have on the community is needed, it makes sense um, for those, if they are struggling indeed, to, to be um, sort of amalgamated or taken over by, by the bigger, more sustainable organisations. Thanks, Dale. And Marie? Yeah, so I've got a little bit of a differing view. Um, I do agree that COVID uh, is, uh, when there's a major disruptor, it's an extra stimulus for mergers. But having lived and breathed and worked in the sector for many years, uh, mergers have been um, bubbling along for about 10 or 15 years. So when there's major funding or uh, changes or policy changes or, you know, divestment of uh, government assets, or, and again, with COVID, it does create a stimulus for more conversations and more thinking around mergers. But I don't think it's uniquely new. Yeah, I think uh, if I could perhaps reflect a little bit, Baron, if you don't mind, obviously um, COVID of itself has done a great deal to obviate the need for merger by reference to increasing efficiencies within organizations as a whole. So that where there was duplication, that has been minimized to some extent. And of course, we're living in a world where the idea of waste is now an anathema. 
And as a consequence, I think that's led also to organizations thinking very carefully about the resources they have and how they utilize them. And helpfully, and hopefully, perhaps um, eliminating some of the problems that uh, numerous organizations doing the same thing were actually, uh, has, been has been diminished to some extent. Yeah, thanks, Keith. And uh, it, it's good to hear a, a variety of, of views on, on the question because, you know, let's be, let's be realistic, there are different takes on it. So appreciate your candor on, on, the, on that question, both, uh, all three of you there. Um, uh, mindful of time, I think we have time for a couple more, but uh, there's, a, there's a question in here around what is the right timeline for a strategy to be put in place in the post-COVID or COVID normal, perhaps, world? And I think maybe the, the genesis of the question is things have been moving so quickly. Uh, when is the right time to actually say, okay, now is the, is, is the appropriate time to embark on a new strategy, um, noting that things are, are moving very quickly and continue to move quickly? Um, and I just, I think there's, there's probably a, a few different ways to, to think about that answer. And, and obviously there's a range of different risks about, you know, um, putting a new strategy in place in, in uncertain times. But also to Dale, to your point, there is a, a beauty, if you like, in having a real distinct clarity, regardless of what is happening in the external environment. So um, Dale, I might throw to you initially, and then we might go through all four of you, and then we'll, uh, we'll see how we're tracking for time. Yeah, no, no problem. Thanks, Eric. Look, um, you, without doubt, the organisations that we assisted uh, who engaged with this question about strategy early on in the in the crisis um, did particularly well. And what I, when I reflect back, what I take from that is they weren't necessarily um, implementing new strategies. They they might have been, but I think what they were doing is they were saying, we have a ton of work to do operationally that we need to get through. And that is in the very near term, but we actually believe this crisis is gonna pass at some point in time. And we need one eye on the, on the horizon. We can't just become that operationally focused that we don't sort of lift our head from the parapet. So to, to answer the question, you know, if, if there's, if the, if the strategy is nearing its end of cycle, if there's uncertainty about it, if it's proving ineffective in the existing environment or in the ex existing market, um, it's always a good time to rethink your strategy. And, and I think this, to Anne-Marie, some of her earlier comments, I think COVID-19 has, has provided a great opportunity for organizations to rethink that strategy and to, to really focus on what they want to be doing and how they want to be doing it. Terrific, thanks, Dale. I think that was pretty, um, uh, you know, pretty good answer. But I might throw to you, John, initially. Further. Yeah, sure. Just a, a quick thought from me. I, I think it's going to be important to sort of reanalyze if it's already been done, and it probably should have been the ecosystem that you operate in, and really understand what's changed, not just from yourself, but the broader range of players. Um, you know, has the cause demand got greater or less? Has it changed shape? Have other players moved out? Have they moved in? So first step is to really see what's changed in that ecosystem. And then beyond that, uh, where are the spaces um, that, that are left and not covered to, to, you know, on that um, step change that's needed? And there's undoubtedly a great advantage in any first move advantage that people take uh, in this area. But ecosystem would be my point. Thanks, John. Emery? Yeah, I agree with their, their comments as well, but I think it's important to also to remember is don't stay sitting on your hands with it. If you haven't refreshed or taken on board what Dale and John have uh, recommended, then you could be, will be left behind. But you, we should strategically be refreshing, re looking at our um, strategies for the short, medium and long-term horizons. And we have a responsibility to do that, particularly coming out of such a major disruptor to our um, sector. Yeah. Thanks, Emery. Finally, Keith. Uh, I, I think I just deflect to the wisdom of the other panelists on that one, Aaron. But my immediate comment would be: time frame depends upon what it is you're trying to achieve and what's your purpose. So, if your organisation is dedicated to eliminating or reducing the impact of climate change, then your strategy and time frame is probably a lot longer than it would be for organisations who are administering and delivering welfare. 
and services to the community. But um, either way, um, based on, as I say, what everybody else has said, it's just making sure that everybody agrees that's the right strategy to adopt and buy and get the buy-in of your stakeholders to enable you to get maximum impact. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Keith. Um, thank you, everybody. It is 11.59. Um, I just clicked over to 12. Um, so I want to thank uh, Keith and Dale from KPMG. Uh, we really value this, uh, this partnership that we've developed through this um, through this series of events. And I think the, the exposure and insight that you have on the not-for-profit sector and the for-purpose sector is, is really critical and valuable. Um, so thank you for, you for for sharing your time and insights as always. Um, John, um, you know, a great colleague of ours at NAB, JB Weir, um, as I said earlier on, is just a, a, an infinite source of knowledge and it's terrific to have heard from you, John. And we look forward to, to reading the, um, the AFR um, update, I think December 3rd, was it? December 3rd? Yeah. Early December. Um, so keep an eye out for that, everybody. And, and finally, perhaps the biggest thanks to Anne-Marie um, uh, to, to share some of your time, uh, a really you know, amazing success story with Marriott Support Services. Um, and, uh, and I think your experience will, will, um, will have a lot of um, uh, value for the people that, that joined today's call. And, and I'm sure that they would sort of draw some some inspiration perhaps from, from some of the steps that you've taken over the past uh, 18, 24 months. So thank you very much for joining again, Anne-Marie. Um, to everyone who joined, many thanks. Uh, we hope it was valuable to you. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there will be a short survey at the conclusion of today's event. Uh, I would really encourage you to complete that. Um, and uh, look, yeah, we look forward to hearing your feedback and indeed look forward to seeing you at the next one of these. Hopefully we can do one in person soon, but for the time being, uh, take care of yourselves. Have a great day. Have a great week. And um, uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. Thanks.